Perfect. Okay. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Miral Zahir, and I'm a fourth year medical student uh, here at Faisal University. And I gave the, this is my contact information. You can contact me if you have any questions in the lecture. And also, like, uh, please uh, try to keep the questions until the end, or you can write it in the chat and I'll answer at the very end, just because this is, I feel like this is quite a long lecture. I did give this lecture in pre med, so I don't know if there are any people that are here. I don't know, you can write in the chat. Uh, but this is basically like the same lecture. However, in pre med, I did give it a bit like more concise, and this is more in detail for your exam, inshallah. So we can start. So the lecture is iron metabolism, and these are the objectives we're going to discuss today. I'm not going to go into more detail about that. So first, uh, let's talk about what is iron, because as our lecture for today is, we know that it's iron metabolism. So we must first understand what iron is in the first place in order to understand its metabolism, right? So what is iron? Iron is a mineral that is obtained by the body uh, that that's not obtained that is obtained by the diet sorry and it's not made in the body okay compared to other things iron is not made in the body you can only obtain it from the diet okay uh, however what are the roles and functions of iron well uh, there there are many different things that iron can be used for okay for example the production of uh, hemoglobin right and for oxygen transport tra transportation so we know that hemoglobin is needed for oxygen transportation. I'm sure, I think you guys know that as you guys are in the HLS part of uh, foundation, right? However, it's also needed for DNA production. And it's also a very important component of cytochromes. Now, what are cytochromes? I don't know if you guys know or took them before, but cytochromes, they're basically a group of proteins that contain heme, okay? And what is heme? Let me show you guys this picture. So this is basically hemoglobin, what I just talked about. This is what carries basically oxygen, okay? And this is what iron is in. So this is heme, okay? This is the, the small circle, this is heme. And the small little circle inside the heme, that's the iron, okay? So going back to the slide, where is it? Okay, so we said there are three main functions for uh, iron. Oxygen transportation through the hemoglobin and DNA production and a, a component of cytochro uh, cytochromes. So again, what are cytochromes? They're basically a group of proteins that contain heme, which iron's in the center of, that are used for redox reactions. And I'm sure you guys took redox reactions or reduction oxidation reactions in um, in high school. And they're basically, they participate in the electron transport chain. And so the basic model, all you need to know is that it basically helps carry oxygen amongst other things, okay? It's also very important to note that iron cannot be excreted whatsoever in your body, okay? So you obtain it, however, you can never get rid of it. However, it can get like rid of, you can get rid of it in very small amounts here and there from like loss of hair and dead skin, but in generally, like a general fact, iron is never secreted, like never excreted in the body, okay? So this lecture, as going back to the lecture, it's iron and metabolism. Now, what is metabolism? Basically, metabolism is the whole sum of reactions uh, that occur throughout the body, basically, that provide energy for the cells and the body. So is it clear so far? You guys can write in the chat so I know. Okay, perfect. Okay, so so moving on, these are the percentages of iron stored in the body. So iron is divided into like functional iron, which is basically the iron that is used, okay? And this is basically 68% or actually more than 68% of it is um, functional iron, such as, for example, hemoglobin, which I just uh, described as like you need it for the transfer of, ox of oxygen, right? Also myoglobin, which is uh, iron in the muscles. And 18% uh, of it is stored iron, okay? And these are, the, I'm going to mention two important words now that I want you to keep in mind for, I'm going to explain it later in the in the lecture, which is ferritin and hemosiderin, okay? And correlate that with storage, okay? And then less than 1% of iron is used as transport and, for example, like in transferrin. Transferrin, I'll also get into more detail about that later, okay? So... Moving on, let's talk about iron deficiency anemia. Uh, 
Now, recall how we mentioned the functions of iron previously and how we mentioned that there's so many different functions of iron and that one of them is basically to, to yeah, as I mentioned, three of them, basically oxygen transportation, cytochrome, and DNA production, right? What would happen if we don't have the iron to carry out the function? Well, all of these functions won't be able to play out, right? Well, another thing can happen is basically iron deficiency anemia. Now, what is iron deficiency anemia? Uh, before I basically read this and get to explain what it is, it's, it's very important to, to mention that in order for a red blood cell to work, you need iron. Why? Because you need the oxygen. And you know we know that through hemoglobin, uh, oxygen get, gets transported, right? Well, what would happen if we don't have enough uh, enough iron and enough uh, iron in our in our system in our in our blood. Basically, what would happen is we won't have enough healthy red blood cells, right? That's what would happen. So we won't have enough red blood cells, and we won't have the the blood in the body won't be able to circulate properly. So this would lead us to iron deficiency anemia. And when we have lower amount of blood in our body, basically lower red blood cells, that's what basically anemia means. And why would we have anemia in this case? Because of iron deficiency, if that makes sense. So what is iron deficiency anemia? It's a low count of healthy red blood cells due to a deficiency in iron. Okay, is that clear? Can you guys write in the chat if it's clear or not? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So uh, let's move on and explain to I'm gonna explain to you guys now how do I know how much iron is in the body the chat okay how do I know how much iron is in the body well you basically just test for the iron in the body you do this by testing the you basically take a blood test and you test the iron in the body how you do that you do that through four main tests okay now uh you do through serum iron okay ferritin Transferrin and transferrin saturation. So these are the basically four components you need to look for to test for iron in the body. Uh, keep in mind that you guys don't need to know the like normal uh, the normal levels. You don't need to know the ranges. Okay, just for clarification again, NR is the normal level and M is uh, male and F is female. Okay, so these are the normal ranges for males and uh, for females. And anything outside of these ranges indicate any sort of abnormality. Okay, so let's start with serum iron. So one of the four components is serum iron. We test for serum iron. What this means is basically serum basically means blood. Okay, so we test for the total iron in the blood that's circulating in the blood. So it's any, so for definition, it's unbound free iron that circulates in the blood. Okay, as you can see, females have a lower range of uh, serum iron than males. Does anyone know why? Write in the chat. Okay, some of you guys says testosterone. Well, actually, um, Faris is right. So basically, females have a lower uh, level of iron compared to males because of menstruation. So when females menstruate, they lose blood. And that's the only way you can lose iron other than because uh, I just mentioned remember when iron you can never be it can never be excreted other than for example with hair loss or blood or like I mean uh, skin shed well for females you can lose blood through menstruation and that's the only way they can also uh, they can uh, lose iron and that's why the uh, level for serum iron in females is lower than males okay is that clear okay so moving on, I'm going to uh, talk about ferritin. Okay, ferritin is very important. I need you guys to focus here. Okay, so what is ferritin? Basically, ferritin is an intracellular storage molecule. So it basically, it's what stores iron. Okay, keep in mind that ferritin directly correlates to the total iron stores in the body. Okay, and in iron deficiency anemia, you know, when I described iron deficiency anemia, it's the first out of all of these four components to test for the blood. Ferritin is the first one to decrease out of all of them. So one person has iron deficiency anemia and they go get their blood tested. Okay. 
uh, if the doctor sees that the ferritin is low, it would be the first one to, dec to decrease out of all, which can indicate iron deficiency anemia. Okay, so and this is this can help you to diagnose iron deficiency anemia early because it's the first one to decrease. And a way to remember it, I said this as to pre med students, I don't know if you guys remember, but FF. Okay, so first ferritin. So an iron deficiency anemia out of all of these to decrease first would be ferritin. Keep that in mind because there might be pop quiz later on that. Okay, so. Moving on to transferrin, what is transferrin? Basically, transferrin is a protein that binds to iron and it basically helps transfer it, okay? So transferrin transfers iron, okay? It basically helps move iron along in the body. And basically here, we have the total iron binding capacity, as you can see. And in other words, it's basically, uh, it's measuring the total, basically, transferrin molecules that are available in the body to help transfer iron, okay? That's all you need to know for now. As for transferrin saturation, it's basically a calculated measurement that reflects the amount of um, bound iron. So it's basically serum iron divided by transferrin uh, or TIBC, total iron binding capacity. Again, it's not, you don't need to know much about transferrin saturation for now. So now after looking at all of these four com components, how would uh, a patient with iron deficiency anemia present? Would these factors increase, decrease, or stay the same? Who wants to like answer in the chat? So let's start. Let's start with serum iron and iron deficiency anemia. Would serum iron increase, decrease, or stay the same? Perfect. So serum iron would decrease. Why? Because again, in iron deficiency anemia, we have a deficiency of iron, right? So the total iron in the blood would decrease, obviously, right? Okay. Now, what about ferritin? Would ferritin increase, decrease, or stay the same? Perfect. Okay, I'm glad. Okay, perfect. So uh, ferritin would also decrease. Why? Because we don't even have enough stored iron in the first place, right? Because we have total iron deficiency, right? So we won't even have, if we don't even have iron in the blood and the serum, we won't even have stored iron, if that makes sense. So uh, ferritin or stored iron would decrease, right? Now, how about transferrin? Would transferrin increase, decrease, or stay the same? Perfect. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad you guys know. I don't even need to be teaching you guys this. Okay, perfect. So transferrin would increase. Now, why would transferrin increase? It's because it's what binds to iron, right? Transferrin, we know that transferrin transfers. It helps bind and move iron. So when we don't even have enough iron in the blood, transferrin levels will increase because it will think it's the problem, right? If I don't have anything, I'll, I'll, I'll want... Transferrin wants to be more available uh, because it thinks it's a problem and it wants uh, to be able to bind to iron more. However, the problem is because we don't have iron in the first place. Does that make sense? Is it clear? Do I move on? So in general, to basically sum it up, in iron deficiency anemia, serum iron will decrease, ferritin will decrease, and transferrin will increase. Okay, clear? Okay, perfect. Now time for a small pop quiz. Okay, which of these four tests used to assess iron levels is the best to indicate for iron deficiency anemia? Is it A, serum iron, B, ferritin, C, transfer, and D, transfer and saturation? Perfect. Okay, great, great, guys. I love the focus. Okay, so F, uh, you remember how I said F is for ferritin? So out of all of these, the first one to decrease in iron deficiency anemia is ferritin. And just remember F first ferritin, okay, in iron deficiency anemia. Is the question clear? Does anyone have questions regarding uh, this question? Will I do I move on? Just stay clear if you want me to move on. Okay, since there aren't any questions, I'll move on. Perfect. Okay, now how long does a red blood cell live? approximately do you guys know i think you guys are in the heme block so you should know this perfect great great so a red blood cell lives for 120 days and this is the remember when i said this is the homoglobin or basically this is a red blood cell and it includes um heme and the protein or the globin part of it so this is hemoglobin right 
So again, to sum summarize, what is hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is an iron-containing protein contained in the red blood cell that is responsible for delivery of oxygen okay, to the tissues. I'm going to mention um, two uh, ranges for males and females, and they differ, again, because of menstruation. So the normal hemoglobin level for males is 13.8 to 17.2, okay? You can memorize it to 13 to 15, I think, or no, 13 to 17. And for females, it's 12.1 to 15.1. Again, it's lower in females due to the menstrual cycle, okay? These are rough uh, ranges. I don't know, like use the, the ranges that the doctor gave you specifically. And yeah, so I just want you to know that you don't need to memorize the ranges for now. I think, I don't know if Dr. Abdujabar asked you guys to remember uh, the ranges for the final, but for now we don't need to remember them. I just wanted to give you um, a hint of the ranges so because later on uh, questions might come up, okay? Oh, Dr. Rehan, Dr. Rehan, Dr. Rehan is the one that's giving you this lecture, Iron Metabolism. It's not Dr. Abdujabar. It's physiology. Okay, whoever is giving you. Ah, oh, okay, okay, hematology in general. Okay, perfect. So moving on, we now know that the red blood cell circulates in the body um, for 120 days. But how does iron circulate in the body? Well, let's pretend this guy is me, okay? So me, Miral, I eat a... Um, I eat a meal full of iron. Let's say I eat like meat, okay? A source of iron. And then this iron would travel all the way down, all the way down to my intestine. This is my intestine right here, okay? It will travel all the way down to the intestine. Now the intestine, it's important to note that the intestine is lined by, the cells that line the intestine are called enterocytes. So this is an enterocyte and basically they're the cells that line the intestine, okay? It's very important to note too that the intestine or the enterocyte, sorry, there they have something called the microvilli. And microvilli are basically finger-like projections that are on the surface of the um, enterocyte, as you can see here. And what they do is they basically help and absorb the iron. So remember that enterocyte finger-like projections, they can they want to grab the iron. Okay. And this is basically what aids to take the iron inside the enterocyte cell or the uh, or the intestinal cell. Okay, so after the iron gets uh, taken into or absorbed into the cell of the like of the intestine or the enterocyte, what happens is the iron, the iron is basically the purple circle, by the way. Okay, iron needs to be uh, transported, okay, uh, into the developing red blood cell because we know that for a red blood cell to be fully developed and mature, it needs iron, right? So uh, the iron gets put onto a developing red blood cell. Now, how does it do that? This is where transferrin comes in. Transferrin, as I recall, as I said, basically transferrin helps transfer the iron, okay? So it basically takes it all the way from the, um, from the intestinal cell or the enterocyte, and it takes it and it helps move it all the way back, like it tells the time, basically, okay? all the way to the developing or un, or developing or unmature red blood cell, okay? Why does it need to do that? Because in order for the red blood cell to mature, it needs the iron. So after iron, uh, transferrin takes iron from the enterocyte and puts it to the developing red blood cell, the red blood cell becomes complete, healthy, and full, and it's basically a developed red blood cell, okay? An enterocyte. You guys know the difference between enterocytes and enteroblasts, right? Okay, I'm going to assume that you guys know it. So basically, an enterocyte is basically a full, healthy, developed red blood cell, while an enteroblast is basically a developing or immature, yeah. Yeah, it's, and it's the red blood cell, not the intestinal cell, okay? Enterocyte is the immature red blood cell. An enteroblast is a mature red blood cell. How long does it take to develop? Salahatan, I'm not really sure. Uh, you can ask Faris, you can come back to me at the end. You can contact me. I'll research and get back to you. I don't know how long it takes. It's the it's the hematopoietic lecture. I think Dr. Rehan's supposed to get it to you. Okay, so the difference between enterocyte and erythrocyte. Oh yeah, sorry. Did I say enterocyte? I meant erythrocyte. Let's recap, okay? So erythrocyte is a full... Uh, blood, it's a developed red blood cell, okay? While an erythroblast is an underdeveloped or developing red blood cell, okay? An enterocyte, 
This is the intestinal cell that lines the intestine. Okay, they're two different things. Is that clear? Sorry if I messed up the names. Is it clear? Okay, perfect. So after the uh, mature red blood cell, I'll just use mature red blood cell so you guys don't confuse the name. Okay, so after the mature red blood cell gets uh, fully made after we added the iron, okay, it circulates around the body, for, uh, around the circulatory system for 120 days. Recall how you guys just answered correctly by saying that a red blood cell lives for 120 days. Well, after 120 days, the red blood cell dies, okay? Because uh, that's a lifespan. A lifespan. Now, what happens uh, is basically is that it gets the, the dead red blood cell gets taken up. See, this is red blood cell. After 120 days, it died. It gets taken up by something called the macrophage. Now, what is a macrophage? A macrophage is basically a white blood cell that eats up all the basically dead cells in your body, including the dead red blood cell, okay? However, when it eats up this red uh, dead red blood cell, it releases the iron. And again, iron is the purple circle. It releases iron. And after it releases iron, iron has two different like paths it can go to. It can either get stored inside the um, macrophage using what? What stores iron? Shut up, Sarah, answer in the chat. Perfect. It can get stored inside the macrophage using ferritin, because remember, ferritin is the storing, is what is the protein that stores iron, okay? Or it can travel all the way down with the help, obviously, with transferrin. It can, transferrin can help move the iron from the uh, macrophage all the way to the hepatocyte. Hepatocyte is also known as the liver cell, okay? The, or is the cells that line the liver, okay? So, again... Uh, the red blood cell, after it dies, uh, gets eaten up by this uh, macrophage. Macrophage releases the iron. Iron has two paths. Either it gets stored in the, uh, the macrophage itself using ferritin, or it gets stored in the hepatocyte or the liver cell using ferritin. Okay, is that clear? Perfect. Okay, now what regulates all of this? What regulates the entire iron... Uh, absorption, something called hepcidin. Okay, here's hepcidin. I will uh, I will explain it later on in the lecture. However, just know that for now, hepcidin is produced by the liver. Okay, and it what regulates this entire process. Now let's move on to uh, iron absorption by the erythrocyte. So this is an erythrocyte. We call this is you remember this is the picture here of an enterocyte. Okay, and it basically just gets flipped around and this is basically an enterocyte okay could you re-explain isn't it going to be also stored as hemocidrin yes i'll get to that later on barak okay could you explain the slide please and also the erythrocyte uh sidra do you mean this slide okay so i'm going to quickly recap this slide Okay, basically what happens is that I eat a source of iron, okay? When I eat a source of iron, it travels all the way down to the intestine, okay? In the intestine, there's there are cells, obviously, that line the intestine. And these cells are called enterocytes, okay? Enterocytes are the cells that line the intestine or intestinal cells. What happens is basically they take this iron, they because they have finger-like projections known as microvilli, they take and they absorb or like take the iron inside the cell, right? And then when in the body or in the, circu uh, in the circulation, we have obviously blood. We have mature and immature blood, right? Red blood cells. So immature or developing red blood cells, they're called erythroblasts because they're not mature yet, okay? In order for them to mature, they need iron, okay? And this is where uh, plasma transferrin, okay, uh, helps and takes the iron transferred the iron, moves the iron onto the developing red blood cell to make it developed, okay? And a developed, fully developed red blood cell is called an um, erythrocyte. Is that clear? Okay. And then after 120 days, this fully developed red blood cell will die. What will happen after a macrophage or a type of white blood cell 
will come and eat or basically kill or whatever, eat this red blood cell, okay? And it will release the iron. Now, iron has two different paths it can take. It can either stay in the macrophage using ferritin because ferritin stores the iron or with the help again of transferrin because it's the, it's the what moves um, iron in the, uh, in the blood, okay? And it can move it to something called the hepatocyte or a liver cell. And this hepatocyte will also store it uh, as ferritin until we further need it. Okay, and then when it's to, uh, when it's needed, it will be removed from these places and it will be used again. I'll get to that later. And what controls all of this is something called hepcidin, and I will get to that later. Okay, is that clear so far? Okay, of course, no problem. So, um, Samia, what is the meaning of uh, plasma transferrin? Okay, plasma TF, trans TF basically stands for transferrin. And plasma is basically, uh, means blood. Okay, for now, just uh, think that plasma transferrin is basically transferrin found in the blood. Okay, is that clear? Okay, perfect. So moving on, you see how this enterocyte or the liver cell here, if I take it and flip it, this is what I'll get. Okay, so... Um, what will happen? How does iron get actually absorbed into the enterocyte? You know how I explained here that iron will get taken up by the enterocyte? Now I'm going to go into further detail on how it gets taken up by the enterocyte. Okay. Uh, but first, I just wanted to ask you guys, do you guys know the difference between luminal and basolateral? Well, I don't know. Okay. I don't, I don't know, none of you answered, but I'll explain it, okay? So uh, first, I want to explain something. This uh, this is the enterocyte, okay, or the liver, or the intestinal cell, sorry, okay, intestinal cell. Now, this enterocyte has a luminal side and a basolateral side, and this is what I'll explain now, okay? Perfect, okay, so you guys know. Okay, but I don't know, I might be saying liver cell instead of intestinal cell. I'm so sorry, enterocyte is an intestinal cell, okay? So, uh, for those who don't know, I'll explain it quickly. This is this is basically the intestine. You know what my intestine looks like this? This is the intestine, it's cut, it's cut this way, okay? Makes a circle. This is the lumen, or the part where the food goes, basically. And this is the basolateral side. Okay, so this is, if you take this and you zoom it in, okay, you will get this. This is the enterocyte, as I explained with the microvilli or the finger-like projections. This is the luminal side, where the food and the iron is. And this is the basolateral side. The basolateral side basically is where the blood is. Okay, is that clear? Okay. So now that you guys know the difference between uh, luminal side and basolateral side, let me explain how iron gets absorbed by the enterocytes. Okay. So... It's important to note that iron gets absor absorbed by the luminal uh, by the luminal side, okay, into two forms, okay. There are two forms of the iron that the enterocyte can absorb. First, the heme, the heme form, okay, which is uh which is from animals basically, such as meats, okay. And the second type that the enterocyte can absorb is the uh, ionic ferrous uh, form, okay. The ionic ferrous form is also basically uh, from vegetables, okay? You don't need to know that fact, but it's important to know that the ionic ferrous form is Fe2+. I'm sure you guys took that in high school chemistry, okay? Just know that iron can be absorbed into two different forms in the intestine or the enterocytes by either heme iron or ionic ferrous iron, Fe2+, okay? Like you need to keep that in mind, okay? Why? Because the majority, it's important to note that because the majority of the iron we actually obtain from our diet is in the ferric form, okay? Which is Fe3+. plus. Now, um, if we eat the ferric form, okay, which is Fe3+, plus, and that's the one we obtain from the diet, and the only one that the intestine absorbs is the ferrous form or the Fe2+. plus. What happens? Obviously, we need to change the ferric form or the Fe3 plus into the ferrous form or the Fe2 plus, right? This is done by something called the DCYTB, okay? Or the um, duodenal, uh, what is it called? Yeah, duodenal cytochrome B, 
Okay, it's also known as ferroductase. Okay, why? Because it reduces Fe3+, plus, which is what we eat many mainly, okay, to Fe2+, plus, which is the only form that the intestine can, uh, can absorb. Okay, is that clear? Okay, good, good. Okay, so just a quick recap. Iron can only be absorbed in two forms, either heme or the ferrous form, the Fe2+. Now we're talking about the ferrous form, uh, which is Fe2+. Okay, it needs to be changed into Fe2 by uh, the DCYTB or the duodenocytochrome B enzyme from Fe3. Why? It's because we eat Fe3. However, the intestine can only absorb Fe2. So obviously it needs to be changed into Fe2 through the um, DCYTB or the ferroductase or duodenal acetochrome um, B, okay? And it basically reduces Fe3 uh, form, Fe3 plus to Fe2 uh, two plus, okay? As it's the only form that can be absorbed by the intestine, okay? So after Fe3 plus gets, uh, or the ferric form gets changed into the ferrous Fe2 plus form, now it's ready to be absorbed inside the intestine. How does it do that? This is where DMT1 comes in place. Now, what is DMT1? DMT1 is divalent metal transporter one, okay? And it basically takes the Fe2 plus inside the um, intestinal cell. Okay, is that clear? That's simple, I'm, DMT1 is simple. Okay, is that DMT1 divalent tra metal transporter clear? It's what takes the uh, Fe2 plus or the ferrous form in. Perfect. Okay. Now that we discussed the ferrous form, you know how we said the iron, uh, the intestine gets uh, absorbs two forms, either the ferrous the Fe2 plus or the heme trans uh, or the heme, right? So we discussed the Fe2 plus gets tr uh, transported or taken absorbed inside the intestine, intestinal cell. Sorry, by DMT1, divalent metal transporter one. Okay. Now we have another form that can be absorbed, which is the heme iron, okay? Heme, how does it get absorbed? It basically gets absorbed very simply. It has a way simpler process, and it just basically gets absorbed by protein that is found in the membrane of the cell, of the enterocyte, of the intestinal cell, which is called the heme transporter. From its name, it transports and takes the heme from outside the cell, inside, into, inside of the cell, okay? Is that clear? Okay, perfect. So what happens after the iron gets taken into the cell? It can obviously get stored inside the cell. And we said the thing that stores iron is what? Ferritin, exactly. So now that we have taken and absorbed iron inside the cell, it gets stored uh, as ferritin or in ferritin, okay? And until we need it, and, and then it gets stored there until we need it later, and then it gets transported out. But for now, know that it gets stored inside the cell. Is that clear? Perfect. Okay. Now, let's say we have states of hypoxia. Hypoxia is basically a decreased level in oxygen. Okay. What will happen? Okay. Knowing that iron is needed for oxygen transportation. Okay. So we know that iron is needed for oxygen transportation. Uh, what will happen if we don't have uh, enough oxygen or states of hypoxia? What will happen is, is that the uh, body will upregulate, okay, the DCYTB enzyme. Upregulate, meaning it will produce more of it, okay? It will increase the number of it. It will increase the DCYTB enzyme. Why? Because we need more enzymes to help us change Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. Why? Because we, we need more oxygen. So, therefore, we need more iron to help us get that oxygen, Okay. It will also upregulate the DMT1 uh, transporter that's found in this uh, on the surface of the cell because we need to take more iron in because the body needs more iron to help transport oxygen. Okay, is that like as fast as possible? Is that clear? Okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay. So now that we discussed the first part of how iron gets absorbed into the cell and stored inside the cell, now what will happen uh, if we need the iron? You know how we said iron gets up, stored, it gets absorbed and stored inside the cell until we need it? Now let's say 
we need this iron now. What will happen? Well, uh, three main steps will happen, okay? Iron will leave the cell in the basolateral side, okay? Remember, the basolateral side is the side where there is, like, blood, okay? So, uh, it will leave the cell through the basolateral side, and it will enter the blood. How will it do that? It will do that with the help of something called the ferroportin. Now, what is ferroportin? Ferroportin is a transmembrane protein that transports iron from inside the cell to outside of the cell, eventually into the blood. Okay? Is that clear? clear? You can think of ferroportin as, basically, ferroportin is uh, these two cylinders, by the way. Okay? And you can think of it as, basically, a portal. Ferroportin, you can think of it as a portal, okay? That takes iron from inside the cell to outside of the cell. Okay, on the basolateral side. Is that clear so far? Okay. So, after it does that, what will happen? I need you guys to focus here because it's a bit confusing. So, after iron leaves, remember, keep in mind the iron here is in stored as ferritin, okay? But originally it's in the FE2 form because we, we changed it, right? It leaves ferroportin to enter the blood, okay? But... We know that iron is in now, it's in the ferrous form, Fe2+. Uh, plus. Because recall, when I mentioned that the DCYCB enzyme helps us move it from the ferric, Fe3+, plus, to the ferrous, Fe2+, plus, on the luminal side. Now, in the basolateral side, after it leaves through the ferroportin, it needs to be changed back to the Fe3+, plus form. Okay? Now, you might be asking yourself, why does it need to be changed back to the Fe3 plus form when we went through this entire hassle of like changing it to the Fe2 plus form? Well, the only reason we need to do that is because transferrin, which is the thing that moves iron, only moves it in the ferric Fe3 plus form. That's the only reason we need to change Fe2 plus form after it leaves the, uh, the cell on the basolateral side through ferroportin to the ferric Fe3 plus form. Okay? Is that clear? Okay, uh, Mbarak, you have your hand raised. Do you have a question? Which type of iron is stored in the ferritin? Okay, uh, you can think of it for now as Fe2+, plus. okay? Because we changed it. We, you remember how here we changed it back? We changed it uh, from the ferric through the um, DCYTB enzyme. So you can think of it as the, the ferrous Fe2+, plus in, in the cell, okay? So transferrin cannot transport uh, iron in the fair. Yeah, it can't. In the basolateral side, it can't. Okay. I mean, Dr. Abjabar won't like go and ask you this more details about the other body, like the other sides of the body. But for now, in the basolateral side, when the iron comes to leave the cell, you need to know that uh, it can only be taken up from the cell as the ferric form. Therefore. Iron needs to be changed from the ferrous Fe2 plus to the ferric Fe3 plus. Okay. How does it do that? It uses hef um, hefastin. Okay. Now, what is hefastin? Hefastin is basically what changes, it's a protein that changes Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. Okay. Why again do we need to change it? Because transferrin only takes up Fe3 plus. Is it clear so far? Okay. Does anyone want further clarification? Okay, no, everyone said it's clear. Perfect. So, um, now since this is clear, remember in a couple of slides ago when I said what regulates all of this is something called hepcidin. Recall that? Okay. So, what regulates all of this iron uptake is something called hepcidin. Now, what does hepcidin do? Recall how I just said that ferroportin helps transport uh, uh what is it called H helps transport iron outside of the cell yeah okay so ferroportin helps transport the iron from inside the cell to outside the cell now what hepcidin does is that hepcidin comes and it inhibits ferroportin okay hepcidin inhibits hep uh, ferroportin you see this minus sign i added it because i want you guys to know that hepcidin inhibits ferroportin so when we have enough iron let's say we have enough iron in the body, we don't need any more iron. What happens is that hepcidin comes and it inhibits ferroportin 
And we know that the function of ferroportin is to take iron from inside the cell and outside the cell to the rest of the body. But when the tissues are saturated, when we don't need any more iron, hepcidin will come and it will inhibit this entire process by inhibiting ferroportin. So it inhibits the portal that helps transfer iron from inside the cell to outside the cell. So when we inhibit that, we won't have any more iron leaving the cell. It will all be stored inside, okay? So ferroportin antagonist, yes, you can think of hepcidin as a ferroportin antagonist. It stops uh, ferroportin's action. And we know that the action of ferroportin is to transfer uh, iron from inside the cell to outside the cell. What hepcidin does is that it inhibits this action. Okay, is that clear? This is like very, very important for you guys to know. It's like so important. You'll definitely get asked about this in the exam. Okay, now when does uh, hepcidin act? When we have enough iron in the body, okay? When we don't need any more iron. So if this is clear, then that means we can move on, right? I'm assuming we can move on. Right, yes. Okay, perfect. So now that everything is explained, we can now talk about some things that, uh, that favor iron absorptions and some things that reduce iron absorption. I'm sure you guys know that there are two different kind of things that uh, help do that. So I'm sure, I don't know, I don't know if any of you have iron deficiency, but I have iron deficiency. And my mom always tells me to take my iron pill and drink orange juice with it. Why? Because orange juice is actually an acid and it favors iron absorption. It will help my intestines absorb the iron better. Now, uh, acids or orange juice is considered a factor that favors absorption. So let's talk about what other factors favor absorption. Uh, okay, so uh, factors that favor absorption include heme iron. We know that heme iron is basically favored. Why? Because it's not affected by other parts in the diet, okay? Compared to the ferrous or inor inorganic iron, sorry. Uh, therefore, it's basically easier absorbed. You don't need to know the exact detail of this. It's just I quickly Googled it and added it to the slide because I need you guys to know that heme iron is favored and absorbed better than inorganic iron. Okay? Why? It's because the inorganic iron can be affected by the diet while um, heme iron is not affected by other factors in the diet. Okay? Now, another factor that can be absorbed by uh, that can favor absorption is ferrous iron. Remember, Recall that ferrous iron is better absorbed in the intestine than ferric iron. As I mentioned it, you know, because we changed the ferric, ferric iron here from the DCYTB white, because ferrous iron or Fe2 plus absorb, it gets absorbed better. Now, why is that? It's because uh, of something called pH, like pH. I'm sure you guys know what pH is, okay? Ferrous iron is better absorbed than ferric iron because it's soluble at neutral pH, okay? And we know that uh, from point three, okay, acid gets, uh, helps, gets, helps absorb iron better. Okay, let me explain that better, okay? Ferric iron, it's, it's, it's not as favored as ferrous iron. Why? Because ferric iron is soluble at neutral pH, okay? While ferrous iron is soluble and acidic, okay? Uh, therefore, it, it helps ferrous iron, and we know that acidity helps absorb iron better, so ferrous iron favors acidity. Does that make sense? Again, you don't need to know the exact detail of this, but just know that ferric, uh, ferrous iron is better absorbed than ferric iron. Okay? Now, moving on to the third, to the fourth, yeah, third point. Acids, such as orange juice, that's why I remember my mom always tells me to take my iron pills with orange juice, okay? Acids, they help absorb iron better. Why? Again, go back to the second point. It, it prevents the conversion of Fe2+, plus or the ferrous form, to Fe3+, plus, which is the ferric form. And we know that the ferrous form is better absorbed than the ferric form. Is that clear? Simple. Okay. Now, uh, one of the factors that inhibits, actually, or that don't favor... Uh, iron absorption is something called precipitating agents. Now, what are precipitating agents? There's something, uh, so for example, like phytates, phosphates, and tea. What they do is that basically they 
chelate the iron, okay, which means they bind to the iron and inhibit its absorption. So precipitating iron, uh, precipitating uh, factors, they bind to iron and, it, and they inhibit its absorption compared to the solubilizing agents, which favor iron absorption, such as sugars and amino acid. Okay. Now, fi uh, factors that favor iron also include reduced serum hepcidin. Okay. And again, we we said that hepcidin inhibits ferroportin, which decreases iron absorption. See, increased serum iron decreases iron absorption or is a factor that reduces its absorption. So when we reduce the serum hepcidin, we will increase iron absorption. Is that clear? Okay, perfect. Yes, perfect. Okay. So in the, uh, what is it called? In the pre-med lecture, I actually stopped talking about these last three parts. Uh, but for now, you guys need to know them, okay? Because pre-med is just introductory. I don't know if any of you, were you, uh, of you took the pre-med course. But I will talk about these now, since they're important for you to know as a first-year medical student, okay? But first, let's talk about erythropoiesis. Okay, now, since you guys are in the HLS part of foundation, you guys know that erythropoiesis means it's the process where red blood cells get produced, okay? Red blood cells are erythrocytes. Therefore, erythropoiesis is the production, poiesis means production of the erythrocytes or the red blood cells, okay? So in cases of ineffective erythropoiesis, when we don't have uh, proper production of uh, red blood cells, this will favor iron absorption. Why? Because when we don't have um, proper production of red blood cells, the body will need more red blood cells, right? So the body will need more iron to make those red blood cells. Is that clear? Why ineffective erythropoiesis favors iron absorption? Okay, I'm guessing it's clear. And this is the same reason goes why decreased erythropoiesis de uh, doesn't f favors or reduces iron absorption because we don't need any more red blood cells and decrease erythropoiesis. When we don't need any more red, red blood cells, when we're not producing any more red blood cells, we don't need that much iron. Therefore, iron absorption will decrease. Okay. Can I? Okay. So the this will cause a decrease in hepcidin levels. What will cause a decrease in hepcidin levels? Okay, uh, Iman, do you want me to repeat the erythropoiesis part? Ineffective erythropoiesis? Yes, yes, Bilal. Ineffective erythropoiesis will decrease hepcidin levels. Why? Because hepcidin decreases iron uh, absorption, right? So we want more iron. So hepcidin will not be a thing. It will decrease, uh, erythropoiesis will decrease iron, uh, hepcidin. And we will get to that later, uh, Bilal. That's a good question. We'll we'll explain all of that later, okay? And for but is it clear for now, Bilal? Okay, perfect. Uh, Iman. So enough ineffective erythropo. Okay, ineffective erythropoiesis. Okay, ineffective erythropoiesis is basically when we don't have proper. Uh, red blood cell production because erythropoiesis means the production of red blood cells. When we have ineffective or improper production of red blood cells, we want more, we want to produce more proper red blood cells, if that makes sense, right? So we're going to want to produce, we don't have any healthy red blood cells. So we're going to produce more and more red blood cells to get healthy red blood cells, right? So, and what does a healthy red blood cell require? It requires iron, right? Therefore, when we have when we don't have a good production of red blood cells, we need more and better production of uh, red blood cells to make healthy red blood cells. We will need iron. Does that make sense, Iman? Okay, perfect. Now for the last three things I didn't explain in uh, pre-med, but I'll explain now, is pregnancy. Pregnancy actually favors absorption of iron. Why? Because when a pregnant like female, okay, is pregnant, she's not only requiring iron for her for herself, she's also requiring iron for her baby. Okay. 
and for the baby to and you know the baby is making uh, blood of their own and uh, veins and whatever of their own that's why uh, in a whole circulatory system that's why we need the, the baby needs iron as well as all the other reasons why iron is needed in the body okay so that's why pregnancy favors red blood cells another factor that favors uh, sorry iron iron absorption another factor that favors iron absorption is hereditary hemochromatosis now i want you to keep that word in mind okay because i'll get to that later in the in the lecture okay but basically all you need to know about hereditary hemochromatosis now is that it's a condition okay where the body it's an abnormal like it's a pathological thing okay where the body to absorb so so much iron okay it's a condition it's a, it's not it's a disease basically okay that the body absorbs so much iron to the point where it becomes to a toxic level because we know we have a normal range of iron at the end of the day when we get too little of that we'll have iron deficiency anemia but when we have so much of that we will have something called hemochromatosis when we have so much iron in the body to an unhealthy level okay and why it favors uh Iron, basically, it's a disease that causes the body to absorb so much iron. That's why it favors iron absorption, okay? Now, inflammation uh, reduces iron absorption. We'll get to that later in the lecture, okay? Is that clear for now? These, by the way, this is very important. The doctor will ask a couple questions on this, I believe. Okay. Now, uh, if this is clear, let's move on to the regulation of iron by hepcidin. Recall how I just said that hepcidin, what does it do? I want you guys to tell me in the chat. Like, I'm sure you guys know what, yes, perfect. Okay, hepcidin inhibits ferroportin, okay? Hepcidin and inhibits ferroportin. And what it does is basically, does it increase or decrease iron levels in the body? Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All of you guys are great. I'm so proud of you. Okay. So, uh, hepcidin inhibits ferroportin, which decreases the amount of iron that will uh, be released from the, enter uh, from the enterocyte, okay, or the intestinal cell. So how does it how does it happen basically how does it go into detail now that you know how I, uh, how hepcidin works and what it does how is it released from the liver in the first place so this is a hepatocyte okay recall that hepatocyte i mentioned is a liver cell hemochromatosis oh it was by accident okay so back to this we know how hepcidin works and what it does. Now, how does it get released from the liver? Because recall that I said hepcidin gets released from the liver. How does it get released from, uh, from the liver in the first place? Uh, through this process, I'm going to explain now. Okay. This is a hepatocyte, which is a cell that aligns liver. Okay. Or a liver cell. I want you guys to know also in this picture that holotransferrin is basically transferrin that is fully bound or saturated. Saturated means that it's completely bound. It doesn't, it's like, it reaches full saturation. It's full. It can't reach, it can't have any more iron. It's full of iron, okay? So transferrin means transferrin that has iron bound to it already, okay? And we know that transferrin is basically the molecule that helps transfer, the protein that helps transfer um, iron, okay? Now, whole transferrin is tra transferrin that already has bound iron, okay? What will happen once we have enough iron in the body, obviously, transferrin will bind to it, right? Now, when we have um, transferrin bound to iron, it will be called holotransferrin, and it will be saturated. That's why it's called holotransferrin. Now, what will happen is that this um, transferrin with iron bound to it will travel all the way down to the hepatocyte or the liver cell, and it will bind to something called the transferrin receptor 1 and transferrin receptor 2. Okay, this is the transferrin and it has a receptor on the liver cell and it will bind to it. Okay, it has two receptors, transferrin receptor one and transferrin receptor two. Now, when we have the holotransferrin and transferrin receptor one and transferrin receptor two, all of them bound together, it will bind to an entire complex. All of this HJV, BMP, you don't need to know that. Okay, you don't need to know any of those names. Just know that it forms a full complex. 
after the whole transfer and travel all the way down to the liver will, will form a complex, okay? Now, uh, after this complex gets made, after the transferrin with the iron bound to it gets um, binds to the receptor, this whole uh, complex will be formed. And what this does is basically it will phosphorylate a protein known as SMAD or SMAD, okay? So this complex, after holotransferrin binds to the receptors, it will form this complex. And this complex will phosphorylate or add a phosphate group to the uh, SMAD protein, okay? Now, after this SMAD protein gets phosphorylated, it will go tra travel all the way down to the nucleus, okay? And what it will do is it will act as a transcription factor, okay, which will help produce more hepcidin, okay? Now, why will it do that? It will do that because we have enough, because you know how the whole transferrin, transferrin, we means uh whole transferrin means that the transferrin is saturated. We already have enough iron in the body, right? We don't need any more iron. Therefore, this uh after the transfer, basically these transferrin receptors they act as a sensor. We have enough iron in the body. Khalas, whole transferrin will bind to it. It will form this entire complex. It will phosphorylate this S mad protein. This S mad protein, the phosphorylated S mad protein, will travel all the way down to the um, nucleus and it will act as a transcription factor that will produce hepcidin, which will in turn decrease the iron levels, okay? Because we already have enough uh, iron in the body. This is how hepcidin acts. Yes, exactly, to lower iron levels. Okay, is that clear until now? So this is basically how uh, hepcidin gets produced and to decrease uh, total iron levels by to it by inhibiting ferroportin. Is it clear? Adi Taraf, you guys want me to repeat? Just say no, you want me to repeat. Does anyone want me to repeat? Okay. So, okay, I'll repeat. So, let's say we have, okay, let's recap, okay? When does hepcidin act? Hepcidin acts when we have enough iron in the body. Why? Because we know that hepcidin inhibits ferroportin, which will decrease iron levels. Why? Because we already have enough iron in the body. We don't need any more iron. That's why hepcidin gets released in the first place. Now, how does hepcidin get produced from the liver? We know that hepcidin gets produced from the liver. How does it get produced from the liver? Well, we have something called holotransferrin. Holotransferrin is basically transferrin that's bound or saturated with iron. Why does it do that? Because we already have so much iron in the body. You know, we don't need any more iron. This uh, transferrin bound to iron, it travels all the way down to the hepatocyte because that's where the hepcidin gets removed. It basically acts as a signal. It wants the signal hepcidin to be, to be uh, produced because we already have enough iron in the body, okay? It will bind to something called this hollow transferrin. It will bind, something, uh, it will bind to something called the transferrin receptor 1 and transferrin receptor 2. And it will basically bind to this entire complex that you don't need to know the details of. And it will uh, form this entire complex, okay? Once this entire complex gets formed, this will activate uh, the um, SMAD protein, okay, by phosphorylating it. Okay, it will phosphorylate it, which activates. Phosphorylating means it basically adds a, uh, adds a phosphate group, CP, okay? Now that the SMAD protein is phosphorylated, it means that it's active. It will travel all the way down to the nucleus and act as a transcription factor. Transcription factor means it basically aids, it's a factor that aids in transcription, meaning it will aid in the production of hepcidin. And now, once hepcidin is produced, it can go and inhibit ferroportin, which will decrease the iron levels in the body. Why? Because we don't need any more iron. Is that clear? Okay, perfect. Now, we also have, I need you, wait, what's the chat? Okay, perfect. We, uh, I need you guys to focus with me a little bit more. I know it's like 8 p.m. right now and it's a Thursday, but this is very important for you guys. I'll try to finish this as soon as possible, but I need you guys to focus with me because this is a very important uh, part that I'm going to explain now, okay? We have something called the uh, matriptase. Okay, this is some. This is matriptase. We're talking about part three now. Okay, we already discussed part one. We discussed part two. 
Now we're going to discuss part three, okay, which is the matriptase. Now, what does the matriptase do? It basically, it comes when we want more iron. Basically, matriptase acts, it has its function when we want more iron. Remember how we said hepcidin acts when we don't want any more iron? Well, matriptase, it basically, uh, basically it activates or it works when we want more iron. How does it work? It basically binds, you know, this whole complex that I talked about that you guys don't need to know the details of this part, okay? You know, we said that this whole complex, it basically in, uh, creates hepcidin by, uh, activate, uh, by activating and phosphorylating this mad protein. Now, when we don't need any more, uh, when we want more protein, when we want more iron, sorry, what will we want to do? We want to inhibit hepcidin. We don't want any more hepcidin. So what happens is that matriptase acts uh, on the complex by binding to the complex and it inhibits this entire complex, okay? Now, when it inhibits the entire complex, it inactivates it, then the SMAD protein won't be able to phosphorylate and it won't be able to uh, to transcribe more uh, hepcidin. Okay, is that clear? So we talked about two different things here. We talked about when we want uh, when we want more iron, which is through matriptase, and we talked about when we don't want any more iron, when the hollow transferase uh, hollow uh, transferrin binds and creates more hepcidin. Okay, but let's say this is basically when we don't want more more iron. But let's say now we want more iron. This is when matriptase comes in and it inhibits this entire complex and it stops the production of hepcidin, which allows the body to absorb more iron. It allows the, the ferroportin to work and release more iron on the basolateral side. Is that clear? I know it's a bit confusing, so we'll take it slow and everything should be clear, inshallah. Okay, does anyone have any question regarding this? Okay, since there aren't any questions, so, so ma okay, matriptase 2 is a membrane protein. You can think of it as a protein on the membrane, yes. Uh, basically binds to this, all of these proteins on the, uh, and for the complex, basically. You can think of it, yeah. It's basically... When does it act? It's, it's always found on the on the membrane. However, it acts only when we want more iron. Okay, who asked this question? Bilal, is that clear? Okay. Now that it's clear, we have a small pop quiz now. Okay. So which protein regulates iron levels? Is it A, hepcidin? B, hephastin, C, ferroportin, or D, DMT1. Yay, okay, I'm so proud of you guys. All of you guys answered that correctly. Literally all of you. Okay, so it's basically hepcidin. We know that hepcidin as a whole uh, regulates uh, iron levels, okay? I don't think this needs any more explanation. Everything's clear. Do I, do I move on? Okay, I'll move on. Thank you, guys. Okay, so since hepcidin decreases iron release, is there a protein that increases its release other than matriptase? Is there another protein that increases its release? Well, the answer is yes. And this is where we're going to talk about something called erythroferone. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think, Bidal, you might have asked something about um, increasing hepcidin or inhibiting it. This is where we'll get, get to it, okay? So there's something that increases uh, iron release, okay? So we said that hepcidin decreases uh, iron release, and we said that matriptase increases iron release by inhibiting the production of hepcidin through, um, through inhibiting the entire complex. Now there's something else that increases iron release, which is called erythroferone, and that's where we're going to get into more detail. So there are two things that regulate... Um, iron regulation in general, hepcidin and erythroferone, okay? And what is erythroferone? It's basically a protein that is involved in the regulation of iron absorption. How? That's what I'm going to get into the detail of now. Okay. Um, 
this is it basically it regulates iron through a secondary mechanism. And what does it do? what does it do? It's uh, basically erythroferone acts by increasing iron absorption. How? And that's what I'm going to get into the more detail now. I just want to mention that recall that hepcidin decreases iron levels by inhibiting ferroportin. Right. On the other hand, erythroferone increases iron levels and absorption from the luminal side and it's released from the basolateral side. How does it do that? And when would it occur? In situations, for example, when we have immature red blood cells, okay? Let's say we have immature red blood cells, also known as erythroblasts. We would need more iron absorption from the luminal side and we would need more iron release from the basolateral side, right? Why? Because we want the uh, immature red blood cell to become mature by adding iron to it, okay? How does it do that? Basically, erythroblasts, okay, release erythroferone. Erythroblasts are immature red blood cells. Basically, they produce and they release something called erythroferone. Now, what does erythroferone uh, uh, does? Uh, what does it do after it gets released by the erythroblasts? It goes and inhibits hepcidin. Okay, recall how hepcidin inhibits iron release. If we inhibit hepcidin, what will happen? We will have more iron absorption and release. صح? So erythroferone basically inhibits hepcidin. It basically inhibits the inhibitor. Does that make sense? So we have iron and it's inhibited by hepcidin. Okay. Now, if we inhibit the inhibitor, this is where erythroferone comes in, we will have an increase in iron. Is that clear? Perfect. Now, this is basically a visual to help you guys remember. This slide basically shows you how erythroferone inhibits hepcidin. Now, recap, we said that hepcidin inhibits ferroportin, which blocks and inhibits iron absorption and release. Why? Because it inhibits this ferroportin. We said that ferroportin is a portal that allows iron to go from inside the cell to outside the cell. Now, if this protein is inhibited, iron won't be able to leave the cell anymore, right? That's what hepcidin does. Now, if we inhibit hepcidin, what will happen is we will have an increase in iron absorption and release because we said that hepcidin decreases iron absorption and release. Now, if we inhibit that, meaning if we inhibit the inhibitor, we will have an increase in iron uh, absorption and release. And this is done by erythroferone. Is that clear? Exactly, Bilal. Two, po two negatives make a positive. Okay, if we inhibit the inhibitor, we will have an inducer. If that makes sense. Now, does everyone, does anyone have a question on this? Because this is also a very important concept. If it's clear, just say clear and I'll move on. And guys, always, always, you can always contact me through my email or um, or uh, WhatsApp on my, uh, what is it called, number that I attached in the beginning of the slide if you guys have any questions regarding through it. Okay, perfect. Now, let's move on. This slide shows you basically that... Uh, what basically inhibits and what allows hepcidin synthesis. Now, recall how we said erythroferone inhibits hepcidin synthesis. Well, it's not the only thing that inhibits um, hepcidin, hepcidin synthesis. Well, we said that erythroblasts inhibit hepcidin synthesis. Why? Because erythroblasts recall that they, they're what produce erythroferone, right? So an erythroblast, they want more iron. Because we want, they want to mature to full red blood cells and they need iron for that. That's why they will inhibit hepcidin. C minus here, they inhibit hepcidin because we want more iron release. Okay. What's the difference between matrip uh, matriptase 2 and erythroferone? Okay. Erythroferone is released from the uh, immature red, uh, red blood cell. Okay. It's released, it's basically ox, you can think of it as a hormone. Okay. But it's a protein. Okay. It gets uh, released by the red blood cell, and it, basically they have the same action, but one is released by its one is considered an regulating a uh, regulator of iron absorption. Like erythroferone is considered a regulator of iron absorption because it inhibits hepcidin and it's released by the immature red blood cell. Okay, while matriptase go going back to matriptase, all it does is just it inhibits this complex from forming. It inhibits the production. Yani matriptase, okay, it inhibits the formation of hepcidin in the first place, okay? While erythroferone acts by inhibiting the already formed hepcidin, if that makes sense. 
Does that make sense? Who asked the question? As far as that, does that make sense? Afsana? I don't know how to pronounce your name. Okay, perfect. Okay. So, um, where were we? Yeah, we were on this slide. Okay. We said erythroblasts, they inhibit hepcidin synthesis. Okay. States of hypoxia, as I just explained, recall in the very beginning of the lecture, I, I, I asked you guys about hypoxia, okay, or basically decreased oxygen levels. And decreased oxygen levels, we want more red blood cells. Why? Because red blood cells, they're the things that carry oxygen, okay? So in states of hypoxia, we want more iron absorption because we want to produce more red blood cells. Therefore, hypoxia inhibits hepcidin synthesis because hepcidin decreases iron and we want more iron in states of hypoxia. Okay? Is that clear? Now, moving on to erythropoietin. Okay? Erythropoietin basically is what produces red blood cells. It's what is basically... I, did you guys take him hematopoiesis, whatever it's called? The formation of red blood cells. Okay. So you know that, yes, basically erythroblast growth factor, erythropoietin, induces the production of uh, erythrocytes. Okay. So we want more production of red blood cells. So we, we want more iron. Therefore, we inhibit hepcidin synthesis because hepcidin decreases iron. Okay. Now, uh, matriptase, again, we just described how matriptase inhibits the synthesis of hepcidin. Do you, you guys recall that from here? Matriptase inhibits the uh, formation of hepcidin by uh, binding to the complete factor and um, not allowing SMAD to phosphorylate. Okay? Yes, clear. Okay. Now, what are the things that favor hepcidin absorption? Remember, recall that in this slide where I said that inflammation, okay, uh, inflammation, uh, reduces iron absorption. Now, how? That's what I'm going to get to, to now. Okay. Inflammation, where is the slide that I want to? Okay. Inflammation favors hepcidin synthesis. Okay. When we have a body, when our body is in a state of inflammation, it favors hepcidin synthesis. That's why it actually um, reduces iron absorption. And I will get into more detail about that later. But for now, that's all you need to know. Is that clear for now? Okay, now plasma transparent saturation, it inhibits, it, uh, it, uh, what is it called? It induces hepcidin synthesis. Why? Because uh, when the, the transferrin is saturated, saturated means it's full of iron. It doesn't need any more iron, meaning we have enough iron in the body. It will produce more hepcidin. Why? Because we don't need any more iron in the body. Is that clear? This is basically plasma transferrin saturation. Basically refers to the hollow transferrin here. Okay? Because it's saturated. Is that clear so far? Yes, more hollow transferrin. Perfect. Good job, Ilan. Okay. So, any questions so far? Well, do, do I move on to a pop quiz? Okay, I'm going to assume everything is clear. Okay. Shakilkum, you guys don't want to write to move on to a pop quiz, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to move on to a pop quiz now. Okay, so how does erythroferone in, uh, increase iron uh, release? It's a very easy question. Does it A, stimulate hepcidin release, B, inhibits red blood cells, C, inhibits hepcidin release, or D, inhibits the heme transporter Perfect. I'm so proud of you guys. You guys are doing so good. That shows and now you guys are focusing. So erythroferone, it increases iron release by inhibiting hepcidin. Why? Because we know hepcidin decreases iron. And when we when we inhibit the inhibitor, we have an inducer. So erythroferone inhibits hepcidin and hepcidin inhibits iron. So when we inhibit hepcidin, we will have more iron. Is that clear? Perfect. You guys answered it, so I'm sure it's clear. So moving on, is the red blood cell uh, the only cell in the body that needs iron? The answer is no, okay? There are many other cells in the body that need iron for certain reactions, okay? Now, how do these cells in the body take in or absorb the iron? We just, we just this, this entire hour, we just talked about how 
all uh, iron gets absorbed in uh, enterocytes. Okay, now we will talk about how other cells in the body gets absorbed uh, or how iron absor gets absorbed in other cells in the body. Okay, so I just want to show you guys that the green circles, okay, they're transparent. Okay, and the purple circles, they're, uh, what is it called? They're iron. Okay, and the this orangish yellowish structure here, it's the transferrin receptor. Okay, I need you guys to know that because that's what I'm gonna explain. Okay, so the uh, so how does this is let's say this is a random cell in the body. How does it take in iron? Okay, iron in the first place, Aslan would be circulating in the blood, right? Iron would be bound. See here, iron with the um, transferrin, basically apotransferrin means apo. I mean doesn't have anything. It's a transferrin that's not bound to iron yet, okay? The apotransferrin and the uh, uh, the iron would bound to, bind together to make a transferrin uh, iron bond, okay? It will make a full structure. And this transferrin bound to iron, it will go and circulate in the blood until a, cells, a cell needs it, okay? When a cell needs it, it will attach to the transferrin receptor, okay? On the cell, this is a cell, on the cell membrane, we will have something called a transferrin receptor. And it's basically a, a protein that receives the signals that the, the cell needs uh, iron, okay? So the transferrin bound to the iron attaches to this transferrin receptor, okay? After it does that, the transferrin uh, receptor with the attached iron on it, okay? It will form something called the clathrin coated pit. Okay. Now, what is clathrin? Clathrin is a protein that coats the cell membrane and aids it into pitting. Basically, you no know, pitting. Basically, they um, pits. Okay, basically, they kind of what is this? I forgot the word. Okay, basically, uh, yeah, pinches. You can think of pinches. Okay, it pinches and pits from both. Yeah, pinching. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. Okay, it pitches. Uh, uh, it, it pits and it pinches from both sides to form a vesicle. Okay, so when iron is bound to the transferrin, the transferrin receptor will, will take that up and it will form something called the clathrin coated pit where it pinches, you see this, it pinches from this side and it pinches from this side and it will pinch, 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 pinch to come and make a vesicle, okay? Basically, it forms this pit. This pit will, circle, will, will close together and form this vesicle, okay? Is it like an, yes. It's like endocytosis. It's, it, it is endocytosis. It's not like endocytosis. Yes. Okay. So basically, the two sides pinch to form a clathrin coated pit. And this pit forms into a vesicle like structure known as an endosome. Okay. An endo uh, clathrin, a clathrin um, coated endosome. Okay. Now, this endosome or vesicle or pit, okay, it will have. Do you see it will have the receptor with the transferrin and iron bound to it, okay? Now, what will happen? Basically, hydrogen ions, okay, that are already in the cell, okay, they will get started, they will start to pump into the endosome, okay? After the endosome forms, we will have hydrogen ions that will get pumped into this endosome through the proton pump. We know that it's a proton pump because hydrogen has, you know, H plus hydrogen, it's a proton. Okay, it will start to get pumped into this endosome through this proton pump, okay? And it will make the endosome more acidic because we know that, uh, okay, we know that uh, hy uh, hydrogen is an acid. Basically, it acidifies um, the endosome, okay? Basically, and it will have a pH of 5.5. You don't need to know the exact um, level of the pH, but 5.5 ind indicates acidity. Now, after hydrogen gets pumped into this vesicle or endosome, it will become acidic. Now, this acidity, this acidity, this acidic environment of the endosome makes the iron detach from the transparent. Okay. Uh, it will attach from the transparent and the transparent receptor. Now, and then after it detached, the iron will get released into the endosome, okay? It will get really, sorry, from the endosome into the cell through the uh, through the pump that pumps it out, and then it can get stored inside the cell through ferritin, okay? Is that clear so far? Now, 
when the endosome uh, خلاص, it releases the iron because it becomes because because it, it became acidic after the endosome uh, releases the iron it, the endosome because here we love recycling we're for recycling okay the endosome basically gets upcycled onto the cell membrane okay this endosome it's not going to go to waste it's going to get upcycled into the into the um, cell membrane again and then we will use the same uh, receptor again to take in more iron and then the proton pump will uh, you know get basically to cycle the proton pump and then the iron and then not the iron the proton pump and then the transferrin and the transferrin receptor they will all be used again to bring in more iron and it's basically a cycle okay what happens to the release iron iron basically gets released and stored inside the cell as ferritin okay until we further need it again is that clear, Dana? Perfect. Yes, receptor mediated endocytosis. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So now, um, I took a couple of slides from Doctor Abdul Jabbar's slides because I thought it would. It's basically very clear, straight to the point. So now we said that the a cell gets stores uh, iron as uh, ferritin. Isn't acidic supposed to help in iron absorption? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Jenna, I see where your confusion is. Okay. Acid uh, helps iron absorption into the enterocytes. Okay. But in this case, inside the cell, now once uh, iron is inside the cell, it does, this is, this is basically, we are helping iron absorption. See this? The iron was outside. Now we absorbed it inside. Basically what the acid does here is that it helps, it helps the iron leave from the endosome and get stored in the cell. So in turn, we're helping iron absorption. Iron is basically getting absorbed inside the cell. Jenna, is that clear? Oh, okay, perfect. So, uh, this slide is basically cover paste from Dr. Abdul lecture. Um, what's important for you guys to know here, I'll just read it quickly because it's basically a recap from what I just explained. Okay, cells, uh, cells can store iron as a, a reserve, if it uh, supplies uh, of new iron decline, obviously we just meant, we just um, scrubbed that. Okay, macrophages and hepatocytes they st store iron. Recall to the beginning of the lecture, as we said, macrophages and hepatocytes, which are liver liver cells, can store iron. Uh, you know, using ferritin, and ferric iron uh, is stored in a cage-like protein known as apoprotein. Again, that becomes ferritin. We just said ferritin is what stores iron. Okay. And one ferritin molecule, I thought this was interesting, that's why I included this slide. One ferritin molecule, okay, can store up to 4,000 iron ions, okay? I thought I wanted to share that. I don't know, I don't think Dr. Jabbar will ask you that question in the exam, uh, but I thought it was an interesting fact. Now, um, okay, one of you guys mentioned hemosidrin, I remember in the chat, and I said I will get back to that later. Now, this is where hemosidrin comes in place. We call to the very first slide of the lecture where I said, uh, here, where I said the stored iron can be stored as ferritin and hemosidrin, okay? So, yes, ferritin is the main thing that stores iron. However, we can also store it in something called hemosidrin. Now, what is hemosidrin? Hemosidrin is basically partially degraded ferritin. Let's say we have ferritin, we degrade it a bit, we get hemosidrin. That's it, basically. Okay? And then the rest we already explained in previous slides. Is that clear on what hemosidrin is? Okay. So, basically, to regulate iron inside the cells and to avoid free radicals, cells regulate the number of uh, transparent receptor one on their surfaces by regulating post transcriptional functional function of the mRNA of transferrin. Basically, what all of this means is basically, um, you know, how we have go back to the where is it? Go back to here. You know, how we said the liver cell has something called transferrin receptor one and transferrin receptor two. Now, Remember how I said we we can upregulate or downregulate something when we want more iron. We can upregulate these receptors to take in more iron, and we don't want any more iron. We can downregulate them, and it will decrease the amount of iron we have. Well, this is what I'm going to explain now with the um, receptor. Okay, so 
uh, yes, on this slide. Okay, Regula uh, regulation of uh, TFR1 and DMT1. Okay, I just remember all the way back in the beginning of the lecture, I said DMT1 is basically what helps take in um, the ferrous iron inside the enterocyte. And I also mentioned that if I need more iron, I'm going to upregulate or basically produce more of the DMT1 and add it on the membrane to take in more iron. Okay. Basically, I can do that with DMT1. I can also do that with um, transferrin uh, receptor 1, which is on the liver cell. If I need more iron, I'll upregulate them. Now, how does it do that? Basically, we have something called the iron regulatory protein, okay, the IRP. What it does is that this protein, it regulates the iron level, okay? However, it exists in two forms. It exists in the low iron form, okay, and in the higher iron form, okay? Do you see how here it's a full circle? Okay, it's high iron. It's full of iron. We don't need any more iron, okay? That's why it's full, okay? While here, it's, you know, it's not full and we want more iron, you know? So it's like it has a place, okay? Also, this looks like our official logo. Okay, so um, basically, when we when we want in low iron states, we want to produce when we want to upregulate uh, DMT one and transfer receptor one, right? Because we want to take in more iron. See how there's a space here? Means let's think about it that there's a space. It's not full circle yet. We want more iron. Okay, what it will do is that in low iron states, the IRP will bind to something called the IRE or the iron response element basically a response to iron levels, right? We have low iron levels. This part of um, the uh, mRNA, this is mRNA, okay? And basically we know that mRNA is basically part of the, you know, biochemistry. We have translation, trans transcription, translation will will give us uh, the, end pro the end protein, right? So basically, uh, also by the way, ignore this slide, okay? We will we'll focus, we'll ignore this um, second section, we'll focus on this uh, third section, okay? It will, this MR, uh, this low iron, okay, it will um, bind to the receptor on the uh, mRNA, which is also known as the uh, IRE, which is the iron response element on the mRNA, okay? When it will bind on it, it will code for the production of T, uh, transferrin receptor 1 and DMT1 because we want more iron production and we want more iron absorption, so we want to increase them. So basically, that's how it happened. However, when we don't want any more iron, when our iron levels is full, you see the circle is full. When we don't want any more iron, uh, we simply don't do that process. So you see how it, this does not, you see how this el a logo kind of thing takes up the shape of the receptor. Basically, it, it misses, it's basically, it's a perfect fit for the receptor. Okay, this is it, and it's a perfect fit for the receptor. However, when it's full, it doesn't have the shape of the receptor. Meaning it doesn't need, it's not, it's not going to fit on the receptor, you know, because it's full. It doesn't have the shape for it. So it simply doesn't do, it doesn't bind in uh, TFR, uh, uh, transferrin receptor 1 and DMT1 don't get produced because we already have enough iron. Okay, is that clear? So high iron IRP cannot bind to um, iron. Yes, it can't. Why? Because we don't need any more. What's the point? What's the whole point of this? What's the whole point of... Um, IRP binding to, to this receptor to create, what's the point? The point is basically to create more transparent receptors and DMT1 to absorb more iron. When we don't need any more iron, خلاص, uh, it won't bind. Can you explain that again? Okay, I will explain it. Okay, so IRP, which is the uh, iron regulating protein. Okay, it can, it can it's, it's found into two forms, in the low iron form and in the high iron form. In the low iron form, what does it mean? It basically means that our body needs more iron. Our body is in, in has a low in, in low iron. Okay, we want more iron. How does it work? Is basically, you see, this is basically it has the shape of that would fit the receptor here. Okay, what it would do, this low iron protein will uh, go all the way down to the IRE part or the um, iron response element on the mRNA to produce more and to code for more, like when this low, low iron IRP binds to the receptor on the IRE, okay, on the mRNA, it will code for the production of more transferrin receptor 1 and DMT1, which will in turn uh, absorb and release more iron because our body's in low iron state and we want more iron, okay? 
Is that clear? Now, when our body is in high iron state, we don't want to take any more iron. You see how the circle is full? خلاص, we don't want to take any more iron. It's saturated. It doesn't have the shape for the receptor. فخلاص, it's simply just not going to bind to the receptor because it's full of iron. And uh, the production for TF, uh, transfer in R1 and DMT1 will not happen. We will not code for that. Why? Because we don't want any more iron. Is that clear? Of course. Okay, no problem. So, moving on. <clears throat> I will talk about iron recycling now. Okay. Fun fact, the largest percentage of recycled iron actually comes from red blood cells. Okay. So, as we previously mentioned, red blood cells life or lifespan is 120 days. Okay. So, after the senescent, okay, uh, senescent basically means aging. Okay. So, after the senescent or aging red blood cells, is ingested by the macrophages, because recall after we said the red blood cell dies, it gets ingested by the macrophages in the spleen, okay? After it gets ingested, we uh, we now will know that we'll get uh, the iron that's stored in the ferritin. So we know now that the iron inside the macrophage will get stored as ferritin, right? After the macrophage gets uh, takes up this red blood cell. This is something we discussed all the way back in the slide. Where is it? Here. This is what I'm referring to. Okay, so um, where am I now? Here. Okay, so after 120 days, uh, the senescent or aging red blood cell gets ingested by the macrophage. And we know that the macrophage, uh, we know that the iron uh, released in the macrophage will get stored as ferritin. Now, once this iron is, re uh, is released and ready to be released, okay, it will be exported out of the macrophage by ferroportin. We already know this because ferroportin is what helps. Uh, it's basically as, 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 it acts as a portal. It will take iron outside of the cell, right? All of this we already previously discussed. Now imagine these poor little irons, okay, whose houses got taken away. Okay, the iron, the macrophage was its house, and the house got taken away from it because you know, خلاص, it got released from the macrophage. Okay, what they need to be, what they need to do is basically they need to be rescued because they're like little iron. Pieces, you know what I mean? They can't, they can't like float around alone. They need to be rescued. Why? Because if the iron is just not bound and it, uh, just like you know, heme or hemoglobin or iron, it just floats around in the red blood and the and the in the circulation unbound, it will basically end up in the kidneys and it will get filtered out of the body. Okay, and we don't want that because we 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 love recycling here, right? We want to recycle the iron. Okay, so who are saviors in this situation? Two proteins known as haptoglobin and hemopexin. Okay, their saviors they come in and they bind to hemoglobin and heme so that it doesn't get filtered. Okay, so these proteins are basically uh, bind to hemoglobin and heme so it doesn't get filtered and we won't lose them in the iron. Uh, we won't lose them in the urine. Sorry. Okay. And the only way we won't lose them in, in the urine is basically if they're bind if they're bound to um, to proteins and the proteins here are haptoglobin and hemopexin. Okay. Um, so why do we recycle iron? Why do we not? I mean, you might be asking, why don't we just let the iron go and get filtered in the urine? Two reasons. First, because why waste iron? We need iron in the body, right? We want to recycle it. We want as much iron as we can have in the proper amount, you know? Also, um, the second part of why we don't want to get filtered in the kidney, because actually when heme and hemoglobin and iron, whatever gets uh, filtered in the kidney and it gets released so much in the urine, it actually can cause uh, organ damage. Okay. It basically can damage the, the kidney if it gets, gets filtered too much. Okay. Does that make sense? Is it clear? Do I move on? Perfect. <clears throat> Again, I'm so sorry, guys, this is taking so long. I just want to explain everything so that this lecture is all you need to know, like for the final. But with that being said, study study your own lecture too, you know, just in case. Anywho, inshallah, garib un khaldos. Okay, so now I'm time for a pop quiz. A patient is suffering from intravascular, intravascular hemolysis. Which protein will you measure? Is it A, haptoglobin, B, hepcidin? C, ferroportin, or D, transparent. 
Now, you might be asking yourself, what is intravascular hemo hemolysis? Okay, intravascular means inside the, uh, the, uh, the, the vascule, the vascular system, okay? So inside the uh, arteries and vein, okay? Hemolysis means the breakdown of red blood cells, okay? So, and this is pathological. We don't always want, you know, we don't want our blood cells to, you know, die always. So what will happen when the patient, when the patient is suffering from intravascular hemolysis or the red blood cell death? Which protein will you measure? Is it A, haptoglobin, B, hepcidin, C, ferroportin, or D, transferrin? Perfect. I'm so proud of you guys. I'm so proud that you guys are answering all these questions right. Okay, so the answer is haptoglobin. Why? It's because it's basically, it binds to a type of homoglobin that's, uh, that's made when the red blood cells die. Because recall, I just said that haptoglobin here binds to uh, the uh, iron and heme and homoglobin after it's released by the macrophages, after iron is released by the macrophages, okay? Haptoglobin is the savior. Recall, remember that, okay? It rescues, it rescues the heme from getting filtered and excreted in the urine. Okay, is that clear so far? Do I move on? Okay, so I'm, I'll move on. So, uh, bioavailability of dietary iron, uh, iron, iron. So basically, this is exactly copy paste from Dr. Abdul slides. Uh, again, I thought it was precise and straight to the point. All of it, I literally just explained. However, let me read it over quickly so we don't miss anything and if you guys have any questions. So, most of the iron for cellular process, including hemoglobin production, comes from the cycling process. Clear. We just mentioned that. Okay. A small amount of iron is needed daily from the diet. Clear. We mentioned that. Uh, foods containing iron levels of uh, high iron levels include, include red meats, legumes, and dark leafy vegetables. Again, we mentioned that. Although some foods may be high in iron, they may not be readily absorbed. Why? Because they may be absorbed in the ferric form, which is FE3. And we know that the ferrous form is the one that's absorbed. Therefore, we need to change it through the DCYTB enzyme, right? Everything clear so far? Okay. Iron must be absorbed in the FE2 plus or the ferrous form. Again, we just explained that for the absorption through the DMT1 carrier in the enterocyte membrane. Again, this is just recap. Most dietary iron is in the ferric form. Therefore, uh, we need to change it into the ferrous form through the DCYTB or the duodenocytochrome B enzyme, also known as ferroductase, to uh, FE2 plus or ferrous, okay? Especially from plant sources, which is not absorbed. Compounds such as oxalates, phytates, and phosphates, again, also like tea. Remember, we, we talked about the chelating enzymes. They basically chelate and they bind and they inhibit iron absorption, okay? Gastric acid, such as acid, remember, orange juice, for those who have iron deficiency, always need to drink it with orange juice, increase iron absorption or the ferrous iron, okay? But only one to two MGs is absorbed. Okay, you don't need to know the amount of MGs, okay? This is adequate for most men. However, menstruating women, pregnant women, and lactating women and growing children may need uh, iron supplementation, okay? That's why so many um, girls have uh, iron deficiency, okay? Okay. So, heme iron is more readily absorbed than ionic iron. We discussed this. Thus, meat with uh, heme in myoglobin and hemoglobin is the most bioavailable source in dietary uh, of dietary iron. Okay, is everything clear so far? This was just a recap slide. Okay. Now let's move on to something very interesting known as iron overload. So iron overload, what does it mean? It basically when we, uh, means when we have so much iron, you know how I said uh, there is a specific range and anything outside that range is an abnormality, okay? Now when we have so much iron in the body, it can cause toxicity and iron overload, okay? Since the body conserves iron, this may result in the uh, disease related to excess iron storage. Because recall how we just said the iron cannot be excreted whatsoever unless it's like minimal, minimal amounts by um, loss of hair and dead skin and menstruation. However, in general, as a general note, iron is never released from the body. It's always in the body. That's why when we have so much iron in the body, when we take over, uh, over the limits of iron of the normal range, it can lead to iron toxicity and iron overload. Okay? So... Excess iron results when the body's rate of iron intake ex ex exceeds the rate of loss, 
as we just explained, which is usually about one mg per day. We usually lose only one mg of iron per day. Okay, so the body's reaction to iron is to store excess iron as ferritin and hemosiderin. Again, this is just recap. Okay, now this is when the part one part begins. It's not fun, and it's a disease, but it's interesting. That's why I'm saying it's fun. Yeah. Okay. Iron overload may occur in something known as hereditary hemochromatosis. And that's what I said. I'll come back to it later. And I explained it previously that he, uh, hereditary hemochromatosis, basically hemochromatosis is a disease where uh, the body absorbs more iron than it needs. Okay, that's a disease. It's, a, it's hereditary, meaning there is some kind of mutation. Uh, that the body ex uh, absorbs more iron than every these. You don't need to know the exact pathophysiology of how that happens. Just know that it's a mutation that causes the body to know to absorb more iron than it releases, okay? Than, uh, than it needs, okay? And we can also, iron overload can also happen to different reasons, such as chronic anemias, okay? Such as thalassemias. You guys took that, I think, so. Did you guys take thalassemias? If you didn't take them, you don't need to know them for now. You'll take them later on in the block. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so in both circumstances, or in both instances, excess iron leads to oxidation through the Fenton reaction. You don't need to know any of this, okay? But it leads to oxidation of lipids, proteins, nucleic acid, and heme iron, causing the cell to damage and uh, death and the liver, heart, and pancreas. Okay? So, we're going to take it next week, inshallah. Okay, so basically, hereditary hemochromatosis is basically a disease that uh, happens when there's too much, when basically what happens is that the body takes in more iron than it needs, leading to toxicity. And iron overload can cause end, uh, organ failure, especially liver failure, because that's where most of the iron gets absorbed and gets, uh, gets stored, sorry. It can also le uh, lead to long-lasting diseases such as cirrhosis, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of liver sources before. It's basically when the liver hardens and it basically becomes disease, okay? And it can also cause uh, diabetes and heart failure, okay? You don't need to know this much detail. Just know that iron toxicity is bad, okay? And it can cause many diseases and cell damage, okay? Chronic anemias, usually hereditary hemolytic anemias, such as beta thalassemias, can cause iron uh, deficiency or iron loading. No, not iron deficiency, sorry. Iron loading, like too much iron, okay? And again, thalassemias, you will um, take that later on in the block, but basically, um, just a brief yani, introduction. Thalassemia is basically uh, a disease, okay? And uh, and yani, it's a blood disorder that... Uh, causes ineffective erythropoiesis, okay? Ineffective um, blood uh, formation, production. Recall that in an ineffective blood formation, the body, I'll actually show you because this is, this is interesting that you guys can make the connection, okay? Recall in this slide how we said ineffective erythropoiesis, we will, will favor iron absorption because we want to produce more proper red blood cells, but the body isn't producing red blood cells properly. So it's it's a cycle and it wants to produce more red blood cells. That's why it will take more iron. However, it's not producing proper red blood cells, okay? That's why an effective erythropoiesis, the body wants to produce better red blood cells, uh, therefore will take in more iron. Therefore here in places such as thalassemia, when we don't, in places and conditions such as thalassemia, when we don't have proper red blood cell production, the body will want to take in more iron to make red proper red blood cells. That's why we have um, iron overload, okay? Is that clear? And hemolytic anemias can cause bone marrow to develop. You don't need to know this. Okay, do it. Okay, you don't need to know this. More erythroblasts increase increase erythroferone, which decreases hepcidin, re, uh, re, resulting in increased iron absorption. Okay, makes sense because we want more in, in conditions such as thalassemia. Okay, the body the body is not producing proper red blood cells. So again, it wants to produce uh, healthy red blood cells with iron. However, it's not able to. That's why. Uh, they will produce erythro erythroferone will produce to decrease hepcidin to take in more iron to to maybe produce proper red blood cells but the body is at deficit it can't okay this is the condition okay so uh with yeah there, therefore with these conditions we have excess iron accumulation okay is that clear so far you don't need to know so much detail about this you'll take it later on in the lecture but this is just a brief introduction. However, it's important for you to know um, hemochromatosis in the definition. Okay, do I move on? Okay. 
So anemias of chronic inflammation. <clears throat> this is very important because it will come to you actually so much later on in your future too. However, let's start by going back to slide 23, which is this slide. Okay, recall how I said inflammation actually increases um, hepcidin synthesis and also going further here, inflammation reduces uh, iron absorption. So inflammation reduces iron absorption, inflammation increases hepcidin synthesis, which will in turn reduce iron absorption. Why? It, uh, it does that th through something called interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 is basically an inflammatory cytokine. I don't know if you guys ever took that before. I think it's new information. But all you need to know that it's basically something that gets produced as a result of inflammation. That's all you need to know so far. Okay. Uh, basically, in chronic inflammation. Why did I specify chronic inflammation? Okay. Because let's say you get sick, okay. And it's like, you just have a cough for a week. Okay. Or something, your body would be in an inflammatory state. However, all of this, you won't be needing, uh, you won't be needing more iron. You won't be needing, you won't be in a state of anemia because it's short term, your body will recover. Okay. But in state, but for those people who have, for example, autoimmune deficiency, okay, or uh, long-term diseases, chronic diseases, long-term diseases that cause inflammation, such as um, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, HIV infections, malignancies such as cancers, or systemic lupus erythematosus, okay, all of these diseases, they're long case, they're long-term diseases, and the patient will have them, it's chronic, and you know, okay, all of these, they will cause chronic inflammation, the body will be constantly in an inflammatory process, why? Because a lot of them are autoimmune. Your body is attacking their own cells, okay? So what will happen is that these basically will release, in, in these states, the body will, in inflammatory states, the body will release something known as interleukin-6, okay? Again, all you need to know is that it's an inflammatory um, cytokine. It basically gets released. It's a protein that gets released in inflammation. That's all you need to know so far, okay? And it gets released by the liver, and what it does, interleukin-6, basically increases hepcidin. So all you need to know for now is that in states of chronic, chronic inflammation, hepcidin will increase, decreasing iron levels, okay? So hepcidin, we know that it decreases iron levels. Therefore, in chronic diseases and in chronic inflammation, we will have anemia, okay? That's what it is, okay? Hepcidin is known as an acute phase reactant or an acute phase protein because it also gets released not only when we don't want any more iron, but it also gets released in states of acute inflammation. I will tell you why, because you might be asking yourself, Tayyib, uh, anyway, if we need iron in the body and if it causes anemia, why is it going to get released? I don't know if some of you are thinking it, but it has a reason why it gets released. I'll explain that in the second slide. Best for now, you need to know that in chronic inflammation, you can get anemia. Why? It's because um, hepcidin gets it gets increased, hepcidin gets released more, and it will cause iron levels to decrease. Okay. Um, this increases. Uh, this increase occurs in systemic iron levels in the body. Yes, basically, this is a very important to mention that this entire instance it doesn't it doesn't depend whether well you have enough iron well if you don't have enough iron it will occur no matter what because the body is in a, in a chronic inflammatory state the body is diseased okay yes good job good job Maraki. that means you paid attention in class it means uh yes well it basically that's the reason i will get into that later okay so the effect is decreased in iron absorption from the intestine and iron release from macrophages and hepatocytes okay Although there's plenty of iron in the body, it's unavailable to the developing red blood cells because it gets trapped in macrophages and hepatocytes. Why? Because we have increase of iron, okay? Uh, increase of hepcidin, sorry. Now, why will we have uh, increase of hepcidin in chronic inflammation? Well, you may be asking yourself, Tayyib, as I just said, يعني, why will we have hepcidin increase when it, uh, when it causes diseases, right? When it causes anemias, okay? Well, there's a reason for that. Hepcidin actually helps the body against invading bacteria, okay? How does it do that? Well, some bacteria need iron to live, okay? 
now uh, we don't want bacteria because bacteria can cause infections and diseases and all of that, okay? And the only bad bacteria cause that, okay? So if we take away their iron, they will basically die because bacteria rely on iron to live. And when we take away their iron, by increasing hepcidin, it will die. And that's what the body does as a response in cases of inflammation. The body doesn't want to be diseased anymore. You know, the body doesn't want to increase the pathological state or the disease state, okay? It will release hepcidin, which will decrease the iron because the body is thinking, okay, type, if I increase the hepcidin and decrease the iron, I will um, stop the iron, um, yeah, any iron basically levels to the bacteria and the bacteria will die because it will not have uh, iron anymore, okay? So how does it do that? It basically does that through something called lactoferrin, okay? Now, what is lactoferrin? Guys, this is the last slide, okay? Stay with me, okay? Lactoferrin is basically a protein, okay, that binds iron. Now, you may you may think, well, uh, ferritin does that. Yes, basically, lactoferrin is like ferritin. However, lactoferrin is found in uh, neutrophils, which neutrophils are basically uh, the most common and the most common type of uh, white blood cells, okay? They act, they're like ferritin, but it's found in the granules of neutrophils, which are red blood, uh, which are, sorry, white blood cells, okay? How can you think of that? How can you, you, know, you make the connection? Well, lacto, when you, I don't know about you, but when I think of lacto, I think of milk, okay? And we know that milk is white, and you can think of lactoferrin as lacto, milk, white. So it's basically found in the white blood cells, okay? Clear? And ferrin? You know that has something to do with uh, iron because of the parent, uh, you know, not prefix. I don't know what the ending of the word is, but you know what I mean. Okay, so is that clear? So basically what it does is that this protein will bind to iron in the neutrophils. And uh, basically after it does it, it will help take away the iron since it's bound, the iron will not be free anymore. It will um, help take away the iron from the bacteria and the bacteria will not be able to use iron to 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 basically cause more infections and inflammation, and it basically kind of helps the body to decrease inflammation. Okay, that's why hepcidin increases. Okay, so most factors essentially uh, play with uh, hepcidin levels to regulate iron. Yes, basically in general, hepcidin, as I said, is the main regulatory form of. Um, is the main thing that regulates iron okay so all of the things basically they kind of act on it to either increase it or decrease it okay uh so a person with a disease and inflammation shouldn't take iron supplements even if their iron levels are low la la okay so but this is too this is too advanced for you don't think about it that way yeah and if a per person has iron deficiency طبعًا, you want to give them iron because um because basically iron you need iron to produce any red blood cells, you know what I mean? For example, let's say a person who has thalassemia, okay? Thalassemia, uh, the basically it's a, it's a blood disorder. So you need to give, you need to give the, you know, the patient needs to be on lifelong blood transfusions to, um, to basically provide the body with proper iron supplies and proper blood supplies, okay? Let's say someone has severe iron deficiency. No, yeah, you need to give the person iron a specific level to treat that deficiency because iron deficiency anemia causes so many tarats, yani, it's really bad. It causes so many different things in the body because yani, you need iron to make red blood cells. Imagine like red blood cells are yani, your entire circulatory system uh, is based on the small little cell that gets produced, which is the red blood cell. And iron is needed to produce that. And so many different things uh, uh, happen when you don't have enough yeah, any, um, red blood cells in the body, you know, and your body can go into ischemia. You know what I mean? Ischemia means when you don't have uh, enough yeah, any red blood cells reaching your tissue, you know, it can go to necrosis. Your tissues can die by the shar, you know what I mean? So all of that, yeah, any iron, yeah, any hat to your heart, your heart needs to pump blood. And when the blood, blood is not pumping properly anymore, your heart will be in like over... Any become any too much pressure on the heart, you know. So so many things rely on little things, you know what I mean. So all of these things are actually so important, and don't think of it in a any in a person's disease state. You don't give iron anymore. Don't think of it like that, Jenna. Okay, and you just know for now, yani why hepcidin increases in states of inflammation. Oh yeah, so it's more important than infection. So yes, yani. 
for now that's how we think about it. there's so many factors that contribute to this the disease you know what i mean yani, you guys are just first years and yani, just now for now and now yani, now for now just know that lactoferrin okay basically it binds to iron and yani, it doesn't cause it does it's not it, it decreases the availability of iron to the uh, bacteria okay so and that's why aslan uh, the body produces iron uh, hepcidin in um yeah, any chronic diseases aslan if you if you if you know any this isn't always a good thing because again all of this any yani, the body thinks it's good for you because yes in turn it it has a yani, benefit effect it has a beneficial effect by you know decreasing the amount of um iron available for the for the bacteria but in a whole general sense when we increase so much hepcidin in the body look what it will cause it will cause anemia that's why it's called that's why it's called anemia of chronic inflammation and as a whole kind of thing it's not a good thing you know what i mean and it will cause anemia and it can cause so many yeah, bad things you know what i mean so hepcidin increases lact lactoferrin yeah so basically hepcidin what it does, yeah, you can think of you know, hepcidin increases lactoferrin. Basically, hepcidin increases iron. Okay, yani, you can think of it in turn. Yani, it's not they don't have a direct correlation, but hepcidin increases iron. Okay, and lactoferrin will basically bind to iron. It's basically a binding protein. It's an iron binding protein. Okay, when we have increased uh, iron, the lactoferrin will increase and it will bind to iron to take the iron away from the bacteria. Basically, okay. Is that clear? Okay, perfect. So this is the end of the lecture. I have two questions, you know, to refresh your memories. Um, so doesn't hepcidin inhibit iron release? Yes, okay, the, let me, let's go back, let's go back. Sarfish way confusion. Okay. Hepcidin. بالغلط I said increase يمكن صحيح. Hepcidin. Okay. Let me let's recap. Anemia of chronic inflammation causes hepcidin to increase because of the interleukin six. When the when hepcidin increases, we will have decrease in iron levels. Okay. Decrease in iron levels. Why? Because we don't want this iron to be available for bacteria. For example, and yani, because we don't want infection to cause. Uh, to, to happen you know what i mean that's why hepcidin uh, in the increase and it decreases iron levels another thing that can happen is something uh in, in anemia of chronic inflammation is the production of lactoferrin lactoferrin will be produced and it will bind to the iron that's already there you know what i mean even though hepcidin yeah and hepcidin does increase but same can hepcidin doesn't take away all the iron you know what i mean Lactoferrin also works in anemia of chronic diseases to decrease. And if you act on a mechanism that can decrease iron levels, you know, not only hepcidin. Yani, lactoferrin is also one of them. You know, it will decrease iron uh, levels to take it away from the bacteria. So there are two independent things killing bacteria. Sure, you can think of it like that. Basically, um, yeah, they can they can kill bacteria because they're trying to take iron away from it. Okay, is that clear? Who uh, are Iman and Jenna? Okay, perfect, perfect. So now for the questions. Okay, Miral is a 20 year old female, this is me, okay, with iron deficiency anemia. She went to her doctor to test her iron levels. Which of the following answers is correct regarding her iron test, uh, her iron levels test results? Is it A, increase serum iron, de uh, decrease ferritin, decrease transferrin, or B, decrease serum iron, decrease ferritin and increase transferrin, C, decreased serum iron, unchanged ferritin, or decreased transferrin, or D, increased serum iron, decreased ferritin, and increased transferrin. I want you all to answer this question right. Perfect. I'm so proud of you guys. All of you guys answered B, and the correct answer is B, because recall the very beginning of our lecture, we said, uh, we said iron deficiency anemia causes decreased serum iron, because we don't have iron in the first place, decreased ferritin, because uh, there, we don't have stored iron, and increase transferrin because we want to uh, we want more any more iron to bind to transferrin to help move it. That's why. Okay, is that clear? Is this question clear? Do I move on to the last question? 
Okay, uh, since I'm not getting any more questions. Okay, perfect. So the last question of this entire lecture is, I actually stole this from Dr. Abdul Jabbar, so I don't know if you guys already know this question or not. But a 40-year-old female with SLE, or systemic lupus erythematosus, okay, erythema erythematosus, okay? It's a basically a chronic uh, inflammation, uh, it's an autoimmune disorder that causes inflammation, okay? So a 40-year-old female with SLE complains of increasing fatigue over the past several months. On exam, she is found to have a hemoglobin level of 9.3 grams per deciliter. Recall that the normal hemoglobin levels for females is around 12.1 till, um, I literally forgot, Just let me check. 12.1 till 15 or something like that. Let me check. The normal hemoglobin levels for female, yeah, is 12.1 to 15.1, okay? So let's go back to the question. A 40-year-old uh, female with SLE complains of increasing fatigue over the past several months. On exam, she's found to have hemoglobin level of 9.3, which is low, okay? A blood smear is obtained and shows normal cytic, a normal chromic, normal cytic erythrocytes, meaning the red blood cells have normal shape and normal color. An iron panel is obtained with the following values. Iron levels, which is 43, which is low, okay? TIBC, or you can think of it as just transferrin, is levels of 212, which is low. I'm telling you guys the results, uh, their ranges, because you don't need to know the ranges, okay? And ferritin is 368, which is high. So we have low iron, low transferrin, and high ferritin. What's the most likely diagnosis? Is it A, anemia of chronic disease, B, B12 deficiency, C, Iron deficiency or D, po uh, lead poisoning. What are you guys' answers? C, A, A. Okay, so the answer is actually A. Now, this I know this is way an advanced question. That's why I kept it to the very end. And yeah, you guys know uh, anything, you know what I mean? You can find these questions, I think, on like Amboss or you know, they're way advanced, okay? But uh, let's let's dive into the question together, okay? A fourth-year-old female uh, complains with SLE. Okay, what is SLE? SLE is an autoimmune disorder, okay? You guys might know it as lupus, okay? It's an autoimmune disorder. That, and we call autoimmune disorders here, we just explained them, that they can cause chronic inflammation, okay? So um, that's your first hint, why the answer is A, anemia of chronic disease, okay? The second hint is that she's found to, uh, to have hemoglobin of 9.3, so you know that the patient is anemic, okay? Now, what kind of anemia? I know all of these three, the top three, are anemia. Now, what type of anemia is it? This is where the second hint comes in. The blood smear shows normal cytic, norm, uh, normal chromic, normal cytic erythrocytes. I don't know if you guys took this walala yet, but normal, uh, normal chromic, normal cytic erythrocytes means that the red blood cells are normal in shape and in color. Okay, compared to iron deficiency anemia, the red blood cells will be microcytic and not microcytic erythrocytes. Okay, they will be smaller in size. While in B12 deficiency, there will be macrocytic. They will be bigger in size, okay? So this is another hint that the um, red blood cells are normal chromic, normal cytic. That's why we can rule out iron deficiency anemia and B12 deficiency anemia. And from the third hint is the iron panel, okay? The iron level is low. Yes, the iron level will be also low in iron deficiency. However, we rule that out. The transparent level is low. However, the ferritin level is high. So... In, in um, what is it called? In anemia of chronic disease, iron will be low. It's, it's, uh, it's a known thing, and I'll keep this in your mind. Iron will be low. Transferrin will be low. However, ferritin will be high compared to iron deficiency anemia where ferritin will be low. Okay? Does this answer your question? Why? Um, where all, oh, you guys took this? Perfect. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So does it does this question make sense? It's way advanced, but if you guys start thinking any yani, this way, inshallah, will help you a lot in your exams. Is ferritin high because of lactoferrin? Uh, I'm not really sure why uh ferritin is high. I will I will Google that. I will get any. Yani, I will make sure of that from the lecture too. And let me wait. Let me think about this. Is why is lactoferrin high? Why is um, what's the question again? Let me look. Okay. 
is uh, fairton high because of yeah yeah you can yes 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 makes sense fairton is high because uh, fairton also acts like lactoferrin and will also bind to pro to 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 what is it called to the iron because we don't want iron to be, yani, be loosely in the body okay okay perfect is this question clear do you have any question regarding uh why the answer can you quickly go through iron regulation slide again okay uh, I'll answer your question. Thank you so much for listening, guys. This is the end. Yani, whoever wants to leave now, you can leave. Whoever has questions, don't hesitate to ask, or you can contact me on my email or uh, WhatsApp or anything. I added my contact information at the beginning. Um, what is it, Chad? If you want to stop the recording, I can ask them to unmute and I can explain to you guys everything. And you guys can unmute and ask me your questions, or you, can, you guys can check them in the chat and I will answer them. So thank you. So